All right, let's talk about five mistakes that I made in medical school. And I'm going to give you a bonus tip. And one of these actually cost me a whole semester. Please listen up so you can avoid them. My very first mistake was not making friends sooner. And I know that sounds like something here all the time. But listen, when your parents say go and study and you're not here to make friends and all of that, they don't mean do not make friends that are going to help you. Try to make good friends as soon as possible because if you don't have friends, you'll be studying the hardest just to get average marks. I have had so many situations where I have felt confident that I'm ready for this exam. I get there and my friend runs me through a topic or a few topics that I didn't actually study or I, I didn't actually, you know, think to pay much attention on those. And we get in the exam room and guess what? The exam is literally best on 80% what I was taught literally 30 minutes before getting into the exam room. Now imagine what the result of that would have been if you, my friend, decided to exist in isolation, to study on your own, write everything on your own, come out alone. It would have been a disaster. And I have now warmed up to, you know, talking to people, trying to get information from people and whatnot. Back then, I feel like I wasn't that kind of a person, but now things have changed. Unfortunately, there's still a few people that I've noticed are still like that. And you would have everybody else come out of the exam room rejoicing and just being happy about how the paper was because they discuss in groups. But you decided to do it alone and you're now one of the very few people that didn't actually get a good grade on that exam who thought the exam was so hard. But friends don't just come in handy for that alone. The fact that you're discussing those topics before the exam makes it more likely that all of you in the group, if not like 90% of you in the group are probably going to write similar answers. So imagine if you discuss the wrong thing and you all end up writing similar wrong answers. The likelihood of them moderating your paper is higher because a lot of you have failed than you discussing on your own and telling yourself lies. Because it's one person against how many? Friends also make studying a lot more faster if all of you are active participants. Because you can divide yourself and say, okay, you do this topic, do this topic, do this topic, do this topic. We come together and you run us through this, you run us through that. Instead of you just studying alone and going through all of those topics, it will take you way longer than it would if somebody else came and told you the same topic in 10 minutes, in 20 minutes, and you're done. And you might even understand it better. Making friends and studying with friends is one of the easiest study smart and not hard tricks ever. It is really my number one tip. As long as you don't have friends that are not sketchy, be aware of people that are always telling you when you ask them anything, have you studied that topic? Ah, on me, I haven't studied yet. I'm sorry. That one, no, I haven't. Ish, I even didn't study yesterday. You, every time, you're the one that hasn't studied. You're the one that doesn't know anything every single time. They're always wanting to you know, getting information from you and never giving anything back. They never have notes. They never have past papers. Be aware, please. Make the right friends and your life will be like 10 times easier. This I can promise you. Mistake number two was skipping classes because the lecturer is so boring. He literally reads his PowerPoint word for word. Like you can literally just follow through. If he misses a word, you can remind each other so you can read it again. That is very boring teaching. I'm just going to say it, I, it's really, really boring, but hear me out. How many times have you ever said, I am going to get the lecture notes, I'm going to get the PowerPoints, I don't need to be there to be bored for two hours, one hour, 30 minutes. How many times have you actually gone back to read at the time you said you were going to read? If you say, I'm sleeping the class so I can use that time to actually read. How many times do you actually read for the time that you are located to read? Very rarely, for me at least. Very rarely, I find myself doing other things instead of what I thought I would be using that time for. And before you know it, it's been weeks. It's been months. The, the mid-semester is here. The final exam is here. And you're like, wait, what class did I miss again? <laughs> it's so much that powers up before you know it and you are just swamped with work. So my advice is just go. Even if it's boring, just go. One thing you can try to do that might help is actually going through the notes. If the, the type of lecturers that actually send you notes before you go for that class, read through the notes. Just have an understanding for yourself so that when you're there, it's not so boring. You can have some questions that you make up, even if it's just to wake yourself up. Ask. And before you know it, the class will be over. You would have had something at least. Even if you're just reading through, you'd have actually at least read through 
to prepare for the time that you're actually going to study. Number three was me trying to finish all the PowerPoints before actually getting to the exam room. Now, I had a fear that I may not study something and then it ends up coming. So I literally just tried my best to just go through every single PowerPoint before going to the exam. And that just drained me. It just drained me so much that I actually ended up dreading studying. I could have studied like five topics in a week. And then before I get to the sixth one, I'm just like, Bruh, no, I'm done. This is too much. And then you, sl you literally just slip down into bad habits. You no longer want to study anymore. I feel like that is just so much draining. What I would do, what I do now at least, is try to start with past papers. Always try to start with past papers. What you find in the past papers is what I'm going to study. If it's not in the past paper, it's what I'm going to study the last. I don't care whether or not it's some PowerPoint that is 200 pages, slides, I don't care. If it's not in the, power, in the past papers that I have, I'm going to study it last. As long as I have cleared everything in the past papers, I feel like at least I'm safe to have a passing mark. Because a lot of times, most of these questions are actually just rephrase questions. Sometimes I don't even care to rephrase them at all. I feel like these people are maybe too busy to care about rewriting questions or just writing new ones altogether. They are really recycled. Most of them are actually recycled. They may be phrased a little bit different, but it's literally the same thing they're asking you over and over again. So my thing now is go through past papers. The likelihood of what is in that past paper or the past papers that you have coming back into your paper is like 70%. You're going to have at least 50% of what was in those previous past papers. If you do a good job of covering almost all the past papers that are available, you are going to have at least 50% chance of everything that was in those papers or some of the things that were in those papers to come back in your paper. And you'd have saved yourself so much time of studying because you are not literally going word for word, studying each PowerPoint in each slide until you're exhausted. So I now use past papers as a guide for what I need to prioritize during my studies. Everything else comes after. I don't even stress myself. As long as I've covered past papers, I feel like I may be 50% ready for the exam. It's not always the case. Mind you, I've had a situation where I thought they're going to repeat questions, but it was a disaster. <laughs> but it is mostly the case in... I want to say 75% of the time. The key for me is to read around the topic that the questions are coming from and not just answer the questions in the past papers and that's it. If you do that, it won't be fun. Because the day they decide to change those questions, bruh. So mistake number four will be shying away from learning new skills. Now, this is not a mistake that I have made on my own. If I have, then I don't remember, but I have seen a lot of people do this where they shy away from learning a skill because for some reason they think they are the only ones that don't know. <laughs> when in fact, we are students, bro. You don't know, I don't know. Everybody around you, there's more people around you that don't know than people that do. The, your peers may have known something quicker than you, but there's still a lot of people around you, other peers around you that may not know what you also want to learn. So just ask, learn the basic skills. Everybody's around to learn. So do not be shy, okay? If there's one thing about me that I always do and try to make sure I do is ask for help. And this might be a little bit irritating. I remember one time they tried to follow me an intern to the bathroom because I was trying to get her to teach me how to collect patients. And she was so nice, thank you. But if you ask, people will teach you. And also, I feel for when it comes to clinical years now, I'm talking about clinical years, but also this also applies in labs, if you're doing labs from preclinicals. When it comes to such things, if you're around environments where people need help and you contribute, you try to help them when they need the help. They're more likely to help you than if you just come around when you need to learn something from them. Some of the skills you're going to learn, especially in your clinical years, are just going to be from you just doing something for the person that may be busy at that time. It might even be as simple as literally just helping somebody take files to the lab or collecting blood or something like that. Literally like small bits that help out somebody free up a little more time to focus on other things. Interns, nurses, doctors, senior doctors, they are more likely to help you when they see that you are around and you are helping 
with everything else going on. Not just you coming when you need something. Every time you're just there showing up for questions, showing up for help, but never being there to actually help people. It is. It just gives a tech tech mentality and it's not really nice. Mistake number five is being the one that is always asking questions. And I know that it's supposed to be a good thing. It is a good thing. Except when you're always the one coming back with the same kind of questions. What I mean by that is you're asking the same questions around the same topic that you've been asking about. Now, you can ask me, what is the mitochondria? I tell you what the mitochondria is. You go back. The next day or the other day, you come back and say, so what is the mitochondria made up of? I tell you, you go back again. And you're, so where is the mitochondria located? You see where I'm going with this. It just shows that you're not actually starting up on the questions that you come to ask me, uh, you ask me about. Which you shouldn't be doing that. You actually should be going back and studying on the things that you ask about because you are supposed to learn them. That's the, pro- that's the point of you asking, so you can learn. But if you're always coming back to just grab information, grab information from where to, what is it, verbal information, it is not going to stick. First of all, it's a terrible look on you because it just shows the person that you're asking about, the doctors, the consultants, the lecturers, that you're not actually reading up on the things that you should be reading up on. And also, it is not great for you personally because you are not going to grasp that information that you keep getting verbally from these people. It is much better when you actually sit down and read about that. Then you'll be like, oh, that's what it means. That's what she means. It is much better that way. Now, that is not meant to shame anybody. I have been that student. I may still be that student a little bit, but it's something that I am actively trying to grow out of. And you should too. And we're now on to my bonus mistake that actually ended up costing me a whole semester. I was actually made to repeat because of this mistake. And it was that I didn't actually take the time to go through the paper and actually read the exam verse. And that actually ended up costing me the whole semester. My school says question in a similar format for most, if not all, courses. And all the lectures follow that format, except for this one time when we had a format well, the actual format that is always followed in preclinicals, that is, is the multiple choice, and then you have the cross match, and then uh, you'd have some lectures do a one way do a short phrase answer, and then you'd have the essay part at the end. So that was the standard format that everybody else was using. If there was anything omitted, it would just be like one out of the one yanked out. Like maybe you wouldn't have the fill in the blanks or the short answer one, but everything else will still be there. So what happened in my case was, the paper that we were going to write was supposed to be an MCQ paper, and it was, except it was not an MCQ choose the best answer. It was an MCQ multiple choice, and it had about 100 questions on that paper. The MCQs carried the most of the max. So for each question with A, B, C, D, E, I remember it went up to E, for all of those options, you'd have to answer against them, either it's, whether it's true or false, true or false, true or false, for each one of those. So meaning each question alone among those 100 questions carried five marks because you'd have to answer for each of those letters. And what I did was answer it as an MCQ, choose the best answer instead. And in my head, while I was answering it, something ticked. I was like, Bruh, this doesn't seem right. How come all of them seem so right? But then I remember one time when he complained about the same thing through the same lecture, and he was like, you have to choose the best one. They're going to be similar. Sometimes some of them may be a little bit correct, but you still have to choose the best one because it's going to be a little bit deceiving. So you have to know which one is the best answer. So I kept that in mind while answering, even though I was a little bit, I was looking at it like, Bruh, this, why are you giving me the correct answers twice or three times? But then I was like, you know, what? I just choose the best one. So I just circled whichever I thought was the best. And it turns out that was not what I was expected to do. It clearly said on the exam paper. And I made the mistake of just thinking it is the same format that we use all the time. So I just answered it as one, two, three, one, two, three, A, B, C, A, B on the next one, C on the other one, just like that. And unfortunately, I could not be marked and I ended up failing that exam. And when I called, because that was a shock to me, so when I got my results, I was like, bruh, how come I felt when it was clearly, I feel, like I knew in my head that if I felt this 
course, if I did bad in this course, it was going to be a passing mark, like a C, borderline. But I'm not going to get like a B plus. I know I knew at the back of my mind because it was actually hard paper to begin with. But I knew that if I'm going to fail, it's going to be like a C. Maybe I may not get a B plus. I may not get an A or an A plus. But at least I'm going to land on a C. So when my I got my results and I talked to the lecturer that was touch, teaching us, and before I could actually explain myself, he was like, no, wait. I know exactly what you did. And you told me how I answered the questions instead. And that just crushed me because there was no way anybody was going to mark my paper that way. And so I ended up repeating the semester and that cost me a whole six months. So please make sure I read through your questions and make sure that you understand your questions before you actually go on answering because some things cannot be undone. And hope you enjoyed this video. Bye. Oh, and since that incident in preclinicals, I heard that there's only one standard for the MCQs, and that is they choose the best answer. You cannot pick between the that or the true or false one. So you're welcome.